What's up, sons? It's Blind Ron with uh, Tech once again. Today, I'm going to go over the five biggest misconceptions about Ryzen, which is AMD's new line of CPUs. So stick around. Number five, Ryzen sucks at gaming. Well, I'm sure you guys have already heard it. The 7700K performs better than the 1800X in games. Well, this is true for some games. This is true for GTA 5, and it's true for some games only in some resolutions. So GTA 5 at 1080p. Now, of course, the argument is that once you get up to the higher resolutions, the games become GPU bound and therefore don't show the weakness of the processor. But the real argument here is whether or not the gaming experience is better or worse on Ryzen or let's say Cabby Lake, right? Well, if you're trying to eke out every bit of performance out of a game and you're doing nothing but playing the game, then the 7700K is going to win, just hands down, that's a fact. But if you're like most gamers these days, you're probably going to be recording in the background, watching a YouTube video in the background, or live streaming or on some sort of voice over IP program like Discord. In these cases, that disadvantage that the 1800X sees to the 7700K goes away. It even starts to get to the point to where the experience becomes better on the 1800X over the 7700K if you're live streaming. Two of the latest games that I tested out that I was able to see this firsthand in is going to be Deus Ex Mankind Divided and Mass Effect Andromeda. In both cases on the 7700K system, if I was trying to use H.264 encoding, I would have issues with hitching in the game, skips, etc, etc. While on the 1800X with H.264 encoding, I had no issues playing the game and streaming the video live to YouTube. The catch here is that there are options using your GPU encoder, such as NVNC or AMD's Relive, where you wouldn't need to use any of the CPU processes and it's a lot less of a frame rate overhead while playing the game. But if you take yourself seriously as a streamer, you should know by now that H.264 allows you to encode at a much lower bit rate per quality than NVNC or AMD Relive. Because of this, if you want the upper hand right now and you're a live streamer and you want to have better quality than your competition, you're going to want to use H.264 and to get the best experience while encoding in H.264, Ryzen is going to be the best bet over something like the 7700K or 6700K from Intel. Number four, the Windows 10 scheduler is not scheduling the threads properly for Ryzen. At first this article came out on PC per and they kind of made an assumption and started to theorize that the scheduler in Windows 10 was not working as well as it should be or that it was misscheduling the cores. The idea was that it was scheduling not it wasn't scheduling all of the physical cores first and was scheduling a physical and then its logical partner along with it, which would decrease performance because the physical core would be able to outperform its logical core brother. The reason I saw this firsthand and thought that it might be true is in my Firestrike tests. In my Windows 7 Ultimate in Firestrike, I got a combined score double that of the score that I got with the Ryzen system in Windows 10. But after AMD took a look at it, they said that the Windows 10 scheduler is working properly and the only differences would be in the actual architecture of the software itself. And unfortunately, we're not really sure what's going on with the Windows 7 kernel compared to the Windows 10 kernel that showed this single kind of use case. A couple of other notes, if you guys hear that you guys are getting better benchmarks in something like Cinebench or GPU IP, GPUP or whatever, and all of those benchmarks are coming out better on Windows 7, keep in mind that a fresh copy of Windows 7 install is a lot more lightweight these days than a fresh copy of Windows 10, especially if you mess up the install of Windows 10 and leave on all of that monitoring going on in the background. If you guys want kind of an overview of how to optimize your Windows 10 operating system 
to perform the best or to lean toward more towards performance and get rid of all that background spyware, I will leave a link in the comment section below. If you guys are interested in a video going over Ryzen and all of the tweaks I've made to Windows 10 to make Ryzen itself perform better, let me know in the comment section below and I will consider making a video. Number three, the Ryzen series is a direct competitor to Intel's enthusiast line of CPUs on the X99 chipset. There's been a lot of speculation of Intel needing to drop their prices because the Ryzen CPUs are delivering blows to the Intel enthusiast line of CPUs in benchmarks. This is true especially in Cinebench and Handbrake and so on and so forth. Unfortunately what you guys might have been missing is the fact that the X99 chipset, which the Enthusiast line runs on for Intel, is a lot closer to that of a Xeon workstation than it is to that of a Z270 kind of consumer line that runs Kaby Lake processors currently, or like the 7700K. The actual chipsets that AMD are running for Ryzen right now are a lot more similar to those Z270 chipsets than they are to, let's say, X99. A few things that you might notice right off the bat, just off the stats, for example, is going to be that X99 supports quad channel memory, while the Ryzen chipsets only support dual channel. Another thing is that on the X99 chipset, you're going to have support for up to 128 gigabytes of RAM, while on the X370 chipset, you're only going to support up to 64 gigabytes of RAM. Finally, the biggest thing that you want to take into account here is PCIe lanes. The X99 chipset supports up to 40 PCIe lanes, while on the Ryzen series chipsets, we only see 24 lanes of PCIe. This is important because in workstation environments or environments where you're doing a lot of productivity stuff, um, when you're talking about anything from graphics design to audio engineering, there's a likelihood that, or a strong likelihood that you're going to be running a lot of add-in cards. And those add-in cards are going to take up PCI lanes most of the time. So you would probably want more PCI lanes if you're running kind of a, let's say, enterprise grade workstation. And in that case, X99 wins. Now, the only argument that I would put out there is that most of the time they're going to end up going with something like a Xeon series in a full on workstation board and not an enthusiast line. But I wouldn't say that that means that Intel needs to drop their price. And I would actually go ahead and make the statement that Intel will not drop their price with the X99 series as it's currently configured. What I would assume is going to happen is that if anything, Intel will create a line that's between something like the 7700K and the X99 series where you have a cut down CP or not a cut down CPU, but a cut down chipset where you'll still get an eight core 16 thread CPU, but on a chipset that doesn't, that is not as robust as the X99 chipset currently is. Number two, the 1800X runs at four gigahertz out of the box. Well, I currently have an 1800X and from personal experience and personal disappointment because I did think this as well, the 1800X does not run at 4 gigahertz out of the box. In fact, most of the time it won't even run at 3.8 gigahertz out of the box on all cores. What it does do is it has the capability of boosting between 3.6 and 3.8 on all cores. And then with XFR, provided you have the proper cooling, it will overclock between 4 gigahertz and 4.1 gigahertz on some cores. Letting XFR take care of everything, the most amount of cores I ever saw it go up to four gigahertz on was four, and that's threads actually. So the most amount of threads was four out of 16 that ever hit four gigahertz. Now that doesn't mean that the 1800X won't run at four gigahertz on all cores, you're just gonna have to do it manually. And I've had no trouble running it pretty stably, actually fully stable at four gigahertz on all threads while running pretty heavy workloads in something like Ida 64. And finally, number one, the 1700 is as fast as the 1800X, or as good as the 1800X, 
or better than the 1800X I've heard as well. This is just not true. While it is true that the 1700 has the capability of overclocking to 3.9 gigahertz or higher and therefore putting it on par with the 4 gigahertz of the 1800X, this is only the top 20% of 1700 CPUs. This means that you need to be in the top 20% of the silicon lottery to have a 1700 run as well as a stock 1800X. The only reason I mention this is because I don't want anybody to go out and buy a 1700 and then when they put it in, say, why am I not getting the performance that I was told I was going to get with the 1800X? It's just the way the parts work out and I don't want you to get confused here. The other thing that you want to keep in mind is if you are buying an 1800X, the likelihood that you hit over 4.1 gigahertz is going to be in the top 20% as well. Now I'm not sponsored by this website and I'm not even sure if you can purchase chips from them and they will actually get them. I do want to test it out myself, but there is an option to buy for a price premium of like $379, a 1700 that is guaranteed to hit gigahertz. Now that's a very enticing offer to me because not only do you cut out the cost of the 1800X itself by about $130 or $120, you also are guaranteed to have that stock 1800X performance. Now does that performance matter is what the question comes down to next and I did want to address that really quick. On a stock 1700 you're going to be seeing about a Cinebench score of 1400 on all cores. While if you bump up to the 1800X and overclock to 4 gigahertz, or let's say I want to tell you guys what the biggest discrepancies are. If you overclock the 1800X about as high up as you can get it and you're really lucky with your pull on that, like top 5% of the silicon lottery for the 1800X, you're going to be seeing a score of about 1850 on Cinebench. Now that's a difference about of about 450 points, but where it really comes down to being interesting is that you will have an extra 25 points in your single score, in your single threaded score on the 1800X compared to a stock running 1700. The reason this is important is because we do already know that the single thread performance is relatively weak and if you want to have a snappier operating system for things like web browsing and word processing single thread is pretty important another thing you want to keep in mind for single thread is an application called audacity if you're a content creator audacity is single threaded and it runs considerably slower on the 1800x than it does on my 7700k and getting that extra overclock from the 1800X on the single thread has made a world of difference. I hope that clears up some of the confusion with Ryzen and it answered a few of your questions. Please let me know in the comment section if you have any more questions. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe as well. And look forward to what I would say is a mess of an overclocking video coming up this weekend. And until next time, I'll see you next Tuesday.